Thank you so much. Okay, I do a lot of patch testing, and I never have as much fun as David Cohen seems to have. I'm going to have to change my attitude and be like, I get to patch test? This is going to be great. Where are your daughters? Wave at us. Is he always that funny? Okay, now I know your mom, too. Your mom's kind of funny. Who's more funny, your mom or your dad? Mom. Ah, did you guys hear that? <laughs> and I think they both said that, didn't they? <laughs> mom is more funny. Please tell her that. She's not in here, I don't think, but she's at the meeting, isn't she? Okay, be sure. I'm gonna, if I see her, I will tell her that. So we're going to run through some treatment pearls for women with acne, and we're going to talk about four things. Number one, hormonal acne and treatment are not just for women. Number two, birth control pills. I'm not going to have time to talk about spironolactone, but fortunately Hillary did that for us yesterday. But birth control pills are still a great idea, but they may be a little bit slow for treating acne. And then really challenging, resistant and persistent acne may, might deserve a workup. And then lastly, low-dose isotretinoin can be very helpful. So hormonal acne isn't just for women. What does horm hormonal acne look like? Well, I've probably been guilty of this too in the past, talking about that lower face, jawline, and muzzle distribution acne as being hormonal acne. But I want to ask you a question. Is this hormonal acne? And how about this? Is this hormonal acne? And the first take home is all acne is hormonal. If you really think about the pathogenesis of the disease, all acne is hormonal. Now, I know what we're talking about. We're talking about potentially that person who comes in, and she says her acne gets worse at certain times of the month. I get it. But remember that all acne is hormonal. Now, we have a new product out called Clascoderone Cream, and we may, this is already FDA approved, we may have this available by the end of the year. But this is interesting because this is a topical antiandrogen. I want you to think of this as almost being like a topical spironolactone. So it's competitively acting at the androgen receptor. But there's also very low systemic exposure to this. So topical antiandrogen, limited systemic activity. And so what's interesting about this is we are now going to have hormonal treatment that we can use in men, not just women. And you may know that people have tried spironolactone in men in the past, but in the study that was done in Japan, they enrolled men in a, in a spironolactone study, but very quickly stopped all of the men because so many of them developed gynecomastia. But now we're going to have this topical without the systemic exposure. So when you look at the pivotal trials here, they were, of course, 12-week randomized, double-blind, vehicle-controlled studies. Over 1,400 people, they had moderate to severe acne. In the studies, they enrolled nine years of age and older, but I believe this got FDA approved just for 12 years of age and older. Males and females, almost 40% of the people in this study were guys. And then remember this number, because we're going to look at lesion count reduction in a, in a minute. Our baseline inflammatory lesion count was about 42 so again, one of my favorite questions, just to make sure you're not taking a nap right now, is how many zits on your face does it take to mess up your day a little bit? And it is not, it's one, it's not 42. So just kind of put that in your head. These people had an average, and that's just inflammatory lesions. That's not including the comedonal lesions. But what did we see when you look at overall success rate? So they started out with moderate to severe disease. They had to be clear or almost clear at the end of the study. And, you know, these numbers are not earth-shattering. Shattering. They're like 16%, 18% clear or almost clear. We're not going to use this by itself more than likely. But there's a nice big delta between the vehicle. And I never want to compare studies. That's totally not fair. That's not scientific. But I do want you to know that oral minocycline in their studies, when it was FDA approved to treat acne, their success rate was 17%. So if you look at this and you're like, uh oh, we're kind of used to this in the acne world, okay? And this is why we use combination treatments and we use things together. <clears throat> Excuse me. How about that lesion count reduction? Remember what the baseline lesion count was. It was 42. Well, you're going down about half. You're going down about 20 lesions by the end of 12 weeks. That is with monotherapy. By the way, remember this was BID. There's a reason it was BID. So when this first does become available and we use it, we should probably use it BID. And we're all going to be so tempted to do it QD because we want to use it with other things. But at least at first, I think we really need to use it BID to give it, to give it a chance to do what we think it can do. So what's the take home here? This is the first topical antiandrogen that we've had. It's effective at the skin level, the androgen receptor level, with minimal systemic exposure. And then it offers hormonal treatment not just for women, but also for men. Okay, second. 
Oral contraceptives and spironolactone still offer a great but sometimes slow treatment option. And so, you know, we're going to use birth control pills to treat acne. In fact, four of them are FDA approved to treat acne specifically. We're going to use them to treat acne, but, you know, it doesn't stack up very well if they're subpar. You know, if antibiotics are just beating the pants off of them, then we're going to use oral antibiotics. So let's just look at this meta-analysis. This looked at 32 studies looking at oral antibiotics and oral contraceptives for the treatment of acne. And what you'll see here, this is looking at inflammatory lesion count reduction. All of these studies pooled together. Look at the middle column. At three months, the oral antibiotics do kind of outperform the oral contraceptives, right? So 53% reduction with the oral antibiotics, 35% with the birth control pills, both better than placebo. But when you get to six months, now look at what's happened. 57, 58% reduction with the oral antibiotics compared to 62% with the oral contraceptives. Now, how long are you keeping your patients on oral antibiotics? Maybe three to four months, maybe you do six months. How long are you gonna keep them on a birth control pill? Probably, you know, very long, long term. Those are meant to be long term treatments. And this is the same thing, but now looking at total lesion count. So inflammatory plus comedonal. And you see the same thing in favor of oral antibiotics early at three months, but then pretty equivalent by the time you get to six months. And so what was the take home here? This was in the JAD, so they always give us the little capsule summary. The take home is they both work. There's a reason they're both FDA approved to treat acne. But we do know that the oral antibiotic kicks in a little bit faster, but you know, in some people, in particular in your patients who need contraception, there may be a reason to not think of these as alternative treatments, the birth control pill, but first line treatments for many of our patients. Now what I would say is use them together, right? One of the take home messages, we've heard it over and over and over at this conference, is combination treatment. We've heard it in almost every talk and I think that's kind of, that's a kind of a cool message. Use them together. So when you use your antibiotic and you're gonna use it for three to four months and you know it kicks in faster, go ahead and start if they need it. Start the birth control pill at the same time and then when you pull the antibiotic off at three months, the birth control pill has kicked in, and then we just cruise on along with that. I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, but I'm worried that that antibiotic is going to lessen the effectiveness of the birth control pill. Well, that's just not true, okay? This is from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. There are two anti-infectives that will definitely lessen the effectiveness of the birth control pill. They are rifampin and griseofulvin. If you are using, I always say this, if you are using rifampin, and for goodness sake, if you're using griseofulvin to treat acne, we need to start over, okay? We have bigger problems than lessening the effectiveness of the birth control pill. But look what this says on the second half. Anti-infective agents that do not decrease the steroid levels of birth control pills, tetracyclines, doxycycline. Really, it's about all the rest of the antibiotics. So you can feel really comfortable about using those two things together. Now, I can't give a lecture about birth control pills without bringing this up. This has helped me in my own practice, and I hope that this will help you. I want you to remember 36912. This is all about the risk of clotting. When you write a birth control pill, or maybe some of you have chosen not to write a birth control pill because you've heard that there is this increased risk of having a blood clot, a VTE, a venous thromboembolic event, or a PE, okay? With the birth control pills, so often, you know, we'll talk about there's an increased risk of MI, uh, and I'm not talking contact allergy. There's an increased risk of myocardial infarction. There's an increased risk of stroke. There's an increased risk of VTE. But increased from what? Okay, so we have to know where we're starting. So we're talking about young, healthy women who are of childbearing potential. So if your risk starts out low and you double it, your risk is still low. So this is the 36912. What is a woman's baseline risk of having a blood clot, a VTE, a venous thromboembolic event, at baseline, not on a birth control pill. It is three per 10,000 women in a year. You give her any birth control pill, you just doubled her risk. And doubled sounds so scary until you say, I'm going from three per 10,000 to six per 10,000. If you give her a drospironone-containing pill, and those are the ones that are equivalent, the, the drospironone is equivalent to about 25 milligrams of spironolactone. That's like the Yaz and the Yasmin products. If you give her that, you have tripled her risk to nine per 10,000 women in a year. But listen well to what that 12 is. The 12 is if she gets pregnant, 
her risk of VTE is 12 per 10,000. So one take home message with birth control pills is you are going to win every time in a safety uh, analysis if the woman also needs contraception. Now, if you're using this for acne and someone who doesn't need contraception, and we don't always know that completely, then you've got a different risk benefit ratio. But still, remember three, six, nine, twelve. Remember how low these numbers are overall. There are contraindications to using birth control pills, pregnancy, breast cancer. Look at the fifth one there, hypertension. You should be documenting a blood pressure in the chart when you start a birth control pill. Diabetes with an opathy, migraine headache, smoker. Um, and there's some caveats to those too, but in my practice, if you have migraine or you smoke, I don't care how old you are or how much you smoke, I don't write the birth control pill, okay? Okay, so is it time for us to move these up and think about these as not being alternative therapies, but maybe being first line therapies? Okay. Really challenging, resistant, and persistent acne may deserve a workup. Now, I don't want to oversell this. Um, I've been practicing now for 21 years, and I'd love to know from some of the other people here, the longer I practice, I kind of think the more I biopsy. Raise your hand if you're in that boat. And, and I'm in that boat, I think, because I've just been surprised enough. And so darn those little moles that just surprise you, and all of a sudden it's melanoma inside you. But the longer I practice, I think maybe the less lab I draw. And so if I'm wrong on that, some of you who've practiced as long or longer than I am, come up and tell me later, but I don't do this very often. You know, I would say this is probably a two or three time a year thing kind of thing with me. Okay, hyperandrogenism doesn't often slap us in the face like this, okay? This might be a very obvious example of maybe a little too much androgen in a female. More often it's gonna look like this, so acne and a little bit of hirsutism. And so what do we do to evaluate hyperandrogenism? First of all, when is the most appropriate time to perform a hormonal workup in a woman who has signs and symptoms of hyperandrogenism? A, any time is fine. B, mid-cycle when possible, but not during the period. C, during the period or shortly thereafter. D, early evening between 5 and 6 p.m. Or E, I have no idea, but I would love to know. What do you guys think the answer is? C, okay, during the period, okay, or a few days after that. And why is that? You know, I try to block things like this from my mind, but if you look at all the squiggly lines, that's the hormonal fluctuations throughout the cycle. And where are those lines about the flattest? Right there in the early follicular phase, and that's when a woman is on her period. So in general, you want to check when she's actually on her period or, or shortly thereafter. When are we gonna check? And people who have signs of hyperandrogenism, and that's things like female patterned hair loss, acne, hirsutism, and usually they're gonna have more than one of those. Now, if they are virilized, we need to check like before they walk out the door. We don't say, wait until, you know, get your period and come back. We just check right then because we're looking for things like tumors. Virilism is gonna be like increased body mass, deepened voice, uh, bitemporal recession, so male patterned hair loss. If they're very resistant to acne treatment or they have quick or frequent, re frequent recurrences after isotretinoin, we're gonna check. We're looking for PCOS. We're looking for weird things like late onset adrenal, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, adrenal tumors, ovarian tumors. What are we gonna check? Guys, remember just two things. We can knock this out of the park most of the time by checking DHEAS, think adrenal, DHEAS, or ovarian testosterone, so free and total testosterone. When you look at the, the, the free amount, it's a calculated number, so the, the lab will also be, be doing sex hormone binding globulin. Just check those two things. Just check those two things, and check during the period. Make sure they're off any hormonal treatments for about four weeks, and the testosterone, we're supposed to see a peak of that early in the morning, so when I put in there don't, to check at 5 to 6 p.m., that wasn't a joke, but you want to check more like at 8 a.m., okay? So that's what this says. And then lastly, I've got like 40 seconds left, and Hillary has got to get up here because she has a flight. So low-dose isotretinoin can be very helpful. I don't have a lot of data here, but I just wanted to put this in. I only do this in women who are of not of childbearing potential.
okay? But it can work very well, 30 milligrams, one to two times a week. Yes, it's a challenge because I can't write eight pills of isotretinoin. So I'm writing 30 milligrams and I'm looking at them saying you're gonna take one to two a week, but I'm not comfortable doing that in somebody who get preg could get pregnant because I'm talking about years of doing this, one or two pills a week, but I have found it to be very helpful. So hormonal acne, not just for women, birth control pills, a good alternative, but they might be a little bit slow. Really challenging and resistant and persistent cases deserve a workup. And then don't forget low-dose isotretinoin. Thanks a lot.